Because China is always changing, as you know. Uh, it feels like they're changing faster. Obviously, they're changing bigger because they're very big, and uh, they are also changing to become more powerful. Um, but at the moment, as I speak, the Chinese, what time is it in Beijing now? Well, they're on their way to the National People's Congress at the center of Beijing to discuss new laws and a completely new government. So next week, we will see new ministers. We probably won't see a new prime minister, but we will see new organizations that will govern China for many years ahead. <clears throat> um, in related to agriculture and food, uh, we have seen a lot of change as for, for, for many years as China is becoming more industrial, doing more industrial agriculture. So remember, and I noted the numbers um, yesterday, Australia has 300,000 farmers, EU 22 million. In China, we talk about hundreds of millions of farmers. I just did a big report on sugar, um, and uh, the big sugar producing area in China is called Guangxi, and uh, they have 45 million people. The sugar industry is very distorted, and they really want to change it, but they have 25 million farmers in Guangxi working on sugar, involved in sugar. So even if they want, this is very hard <laughs> to do. Um, however, uh, China is modernizing agriculture. There are some big trends. Um, so the, um, the biggest trend is that they are uh, professionalizing agriculture. And that's not obvious in China because uh, they uh, traditionally have seen farmers as a status. That's a class, the peasants. Uh, that means that the government has certain responsibilities. They need to protect uh, this class against these evil other uh, forces. Um, but they are changing that now. So you're allowed to make money on farming in China. That's what they're saying. They're going to allow people to make money. Now, how do you do that? Well, first you need to make someone lose. So all this, there can't be hundreds of millions of farmers. Uh, so there needs to be less, you need to scale up maybe. Um, and you need to pick uh, winners and losers. There are big opportunities then to, uh, to move people into service industry, to quality. And that's what they want to do. So at the moment, uh, they are getting their act in order. Um, Xi Jinping, who has now crowned himself for kind of an eternal period, has really changed the way China think about the future. Um, he came in five years ago as the leader of the Communist Party, and he has redefined national security. I think this is very important here. So in agriculture, China has traditionally uh, had a policy of self-sufficiency. Uh, Xi Jinping has come in and said, okay, we obviously can't be self-sufficient. Feeding 1.4 billion people on these kind of resources, no way. Uh, we can feed them now, but in the future, no way. And there are big, big issues with that. Water, as was mentioned this morning, is probably the biggest and is coming very fast. The water tables in China are very low and actually, for the first time, probably they're going to decide at the Congress this week uh, is to introduce a water pricing system. And that's the first time uh, that China will charge for water. Uh, today, the farmers can use it for free well, in most places. How will this affect production costs so on? That's a big question. Um, so they are professionalizing. Um, they are also marketizing prices. That's one of the things they've done in the last five years. Um, um, if you remember, five years ago they had minimum price on um, soybeans, cotton, um, wheat, rice, all the uh, major commodities. Uh, today they only have wheat and rice left. However, they lowered the rice minimum price two weeks ago, I think, and wheat late last year. So they are signaling to the producers that, no, we will not support your increase. You need to lower costs. They're also changing their subsidy model completely from, well, from subsidies to loans. So they're saying, okay, 
you say you want to make money, well, here is your loan, go and make money. Um, but if you can't make money, we will not support you. So they're changing very much that support model. And many people need to lose. Um, it, it's, it will be a gradual transition, but the direction is very clear. Now, so they're professionalizing, but, uh, so, and scaling up, and that means that agriculture is go, uh, going away from being quite primitive, that you have small scale farming, to becoming industrialized. Uh, and, and that's when all the food safety, new food safety issues erupt. Um, in the beginning of the millennia, uh, China had many, many food scandals. And there were big calls for, to the government to fix it. And in this mess, Minister of Agriculture rushed out with a, uh, what they call the um, Agriculture Products Quality and Safety Law in 2006. Uh, and said, okay, Minister of Agriculture in China, and this really matters, so pay attention. Uh, Minister of Agriculture is in charge of the farm, so the production. Okay, you remember a few years later, there was a massive crisis, 2008, in dairy, melanin crisis. And the government then rushed out with the food safety law, first food safety law. Now, the food safety law takes charge after the farm. So, but there is a disconnect here, and this is the problem. And they've been trying to solve this since. And in 2000, and, and they've changed the... Uh, the organization of food safety a few times, but Ministry of Agriculture continues to operate on the farm. These other regulators, um, China Food and Drug Administration, the health agencies, uh, continue to, and AQSIQ not least, continue to have responsibilities for other areas. Um, but now, next week, they're probably going to fix a few of these cracks and one of the things we are looking for is the merger of AQSIQ with China's Food and Drug Administration and the State Administration for Commerce and Industry. However, will they go as far as to integrate Minister of Agriculture's responsibility over farm production? Uh, we will see. Um, but they then at least need to revise the, the first food safety law they, they issued. And um, what I'm trying to say is that problems in the system and confusion will continue to exist unless they streamline their legal system and governance. And, but they are on the way, and we will see a big move next week. I don't know how far they will go. Another thing which we should watch for the current um, Congress is the setup of um, what they call the Supervision Commission, the National Supervision Commission, um, which will be responsible. They're trying to create a, some sort of rule of law system, which they don't call rule of law, they call it law-based governance. But the, 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 uh, this new commission, Supervision Commission, will be in charge of making sure that government official everywhere in China will implement government policies and not implement things that they are not authorized to do. <laughs> that sounds obvious in a rule of law system. It's not obvious in China. Um, but one of these challenges this commission will face is how do they know, how can they govern all these millions of officials in local governments? Uh, well, there is new technology coming in. I think, um, and I think this is really, should make you, we talked about digital agriculture yesterday, but again, I was a bit um, concerned that the focus is very much on the producer. I think these new technologies coming in is really going to disrupt production, consumption, and governance, and value. I heard yesterday that, well, these new technologies will not necessarily increase costs. Yeah, but it's going to really change who is making the money. And China and EU and Australia and all governments in the world now is setting the standard for the future trade. Because um, what will be valuable in the future? I call it the platform economy. Amazon, 
Alibaba, Facebook, Google, why are these companies so valuable? It's because they have information. They have information about the producer, they have inf information about the consumer. They have really a lot of information. They know where you go, they know what you like, they know when you like it, they know more about it in the future than you know about yourself. And it will be, uh, and I, I heard also the senator this morning said that, well, the government will help, but the industry and or basically everyone else needs to take responsibility here. I think this is a big governance issue. I think you actually need to ask the government to really pay attention to this disruption happening in the world now. Um, because China, China certainly has a strategy for leveraging these new technologies and, and change the world order, that's natural. Um, and um, and um, Australia has, you know, you will do well anyway, I think. But it's certainly going to change standards, going to change where the value lies. Um, and these uh, big platforms, um, especially the Americans, if you don't regulate, China certainly regulate them. They have control over their platforms, Alibaba and so on, uh, Facebook, Google. They're not even allowed into China. Um, the question is, how powerful will they, they be? Um, and who are the losers? I think that's a governance, big governance issue. Okay, um, let me sum up a bit what China is doing at the moment. So they're going from um, focus on quantity to focus on quality. They want to import more. So, uh, and their, their economic model has been very focused on export. China has a big trade surplus. They now want to move to imports. Why not? In November this year, China has invited, and this is the big outcome of the Belt and Road Forum last year, China has invited to a Bel um, international import expo. Huge. They built, the, they built the biggest building in the world in Shanghai. And uh, they have invited now the global 500 companies to come and display. Uh, others are also invited, but they need to apply. And China will come with 150,000 buyers over five days. And they've been told by the government to buy, buy, buy. We need to change this trade surplus. It doesn't make sense for China to have a huge trade surplus. Because the people demand more. They're moving to a consumption-led economy and they can't produce it themselves. This is, a, this is a huge change in how China thinks and how they will operate. And it also seems to have a kind of diplomatic value now when Trump is <laughs> saying that, well, America can't have this trade deficit. Um, but becoming a bigger importer, like also John, I think, understands, then you also can set the rules. And China before was a rule taker, and in the future they will be a rules maker. Um, and I was looking at the numbers while we were talking, John, what, who is the biggest trader of agriculture products in the world? It's actually China and EU import almost exactly the same in value. Uh, but I think that, that there is power in, in import. Now, you obviously don't have that power because you export. How do you, how do you deal with that? You need to have a strategy. Um, yeah, um, obviously, with China moving to accept more import, there are great op opportunities. Um, it means that, and I think included, including in, um, well, you're going to talk about Indonesia soon. I think um, this is obviously part of China's Belt and Road strategy. And uh, one concept in the Belt and Road strategy is uh, what they call capacity cooperation. Because China think that in terms of food security, before there was, China thought we can make it all ourselves. They understood, okay, it's not sustainable. How do we do it? We can import, yes. But can you actually feed that volume? It was, Australia is one of the biggest exporters and you produce not even 1% global, global agriculture production. Can you provide China with the quantity that they demand? Probably not. But China's deal here is can we cooperate in increasing your capacity or 
Can we team up with your companies and go somewhere else? Can we go to Central Asia, South Asia? We have the money, we have the market, let's team up. This is what they call capacity cooperation. I think and, and, and it, uh, there's a lot of service um, you can, you can um, offer. Um, and I think there are markets there that has not been exploited by, uh, really by uh, Australia and they are coming. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, more or less what I had to say. So I'm uh, very happy to take questions later and discuss. Yeah, thank you.